Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Unstoppable Mindset. And today we get to talk with Tariq Brown, who is the CEO of Spicoa Aging. I get it right yet. Aging and in-home services. And um, there's a lot to go over with that, and we will get to it. And uh, and Tar- Tariq Tor- Tariq also has a great sense of humor, and he'll yell at me for not necessarily pronouncing his name right, but that's okay because it's fair if he does that. Um, but I agree with him. Just you can call him anything, just not late for dinner. Me the same way, right? <laughs> so welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you so much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here with you and your audience. Well, we're glad you're here. So now I have to ask right from the outset, um, Sikoa, what does that mean? What a great question. So when we first started, Sikoa actually was, it stood for Central Indiana Council on Aging. And as our agency has evolved and the, the Central Indiana Council on Aging was no longer uh, an item, we kept Sokoa because there's some brand equity in that. Yeah. Um, but we added aging and in-home uh, solutions behind Sokoa. Yes, right. sir. It's Sokoa Aging yeah. is our actual name. Right. So it's you're right. The the brand, although I'm I'm sure a lot of people won't necessarily remember that, but nevertheless, you get the 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 brand and and it also gives you a name that people can ask about. Absolutely. Um, to, to talk a little more about our agency, if you don't mind, I'd love to to tell the audience a little bit about who we are, how we were founded, and what we do. I'd love to do that, and I'd also love you to spend some time just telling us about you. But let's start with the agency, and we'll go from there. Very good. I always like to start with the agency. I'm not a person that oftentimes likes to talk about myself. I get a little embarrassed about that, but uh, we'll talk about me specifically. But our agency is a national or a nonprofit social service organization, and we're based in Indianapolis. Um, We were formed from a piece of legislation that President Lyndon Johnson signed in 1965 called the Older Americans Act. And what the Older Americans Act is, it created did is created a framework that every county in the United States would have a planning and service agency um, <clears throat> that is developing, provisioning, and even delivering services in the homes of older adults that are designed to keep them living independently for as long as possible. It also provided appropriation to certain uh, emergent needs of older adults, things like nutritious meals, uh, meal sites, transportation, case management, and some other organizations. Um, We are one of 15 area agencies on aging here in Indiana. There used to be 16 of them, um, but a, but several years ago, one of the organizations combined with another area agency on aging. So that's how you get 15 different agencies, but 16 planning and service areas. We at Sokoa were founded in 1974, and we'll be turning 50 years of age next January, which is very exciting. Uh, a little about what we do. We care for older adults and people with disabilities, again, by providing solutions, answers, and services that are designed to keep them living independently. We know that about 90% of our community members want to stay in their own environment as they age, but many of them are uncertain whether their resources will hold up or whether their health will hold out. And so, you know, our role as a convener and connecting agency is really all about putting those individuals in the best uh, scenarios that will allow them to age in place for as long as possible. Some of the services, 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So some of you know some of those additional services that I maybe didn't mention um, initially are case management, um, information and referral is one of the the uh, we call that the front door or access to our. Uh, uh, service areas or our services, senior meals, as I mentioned, transportation, another one that I did mention, um, home repairs and, mo and modifications and caregiver supports. And so we currently are doing those services through funding through uh, our Older Americans Act, as I mentioned, through the Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver Program, through several Social Security block grants, uh, the state-funded choice program, and of course, our SACOA Foundation is our philanthropic arm that is consistently out trying to find other opportunities for us uh, to better serve our older Hoosiers. We've gotten into some non-traditional funding uh, opportunities, though, um, since my arrival and prior to my arrival, and some of those non-traditional Funding partnerships exist with health insurance companies, uh, with programs of all-inclusive care for the elderly programs, uh, affectionately known as PACE. Uh, we've got a few hospital-based contracts. Uh, we're generating revenue with individuals who have the financial means and ability to pay for a quality service. And then we've got a great innovation and data and research department uh, that is creating social enterprise concepts um, to help us better diversify our revenue and provide more opportunities and solutions for other community-based organizations like us. So you have clearly become well-versed and are able to talk about all this. How long have you been uh, involved with SACOA? Yeah, so I began my tenure here as the president and CEO January 6th of 2020, but I had spent the prior eight years in Michigan working for a senior and disabled service provider um, called Senior Services. So I've been in the industry and in this space um, almost 11 years now, but I've been here at Sokoa only a little over three years. Well, you talk about it very well, needless to say, and um, and I Thank appreciate you. I appreciate the the really in depth description of of what the agency does. I was on the board of an organization when I lived up in the Marin County area in California called Whistle Stop. Um, which later changed its name to Vivalon. And I've never understood why they did that. They did that after I left, but they, they left the brand behind. It was also the Marin Senior Coordinating Council. Uh, Whistle Stop was an agency that provided, among other things, paratransit and, and so on. But that was a well-known name, and they just completely abandoned it. So I never did figure out why they did that. But hey, whatever. Everyone has their ways to go. <laughs> Well, tell us a little bit more about you since I brought it up starting out and, and so on. Where are you from originally and all those kinds of things? Yeah, so originally I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, when I was around seven years old, so my mom's entire career she spent in Big Farm. And um, we, she, we were living in Atlanta, uh, and she got a call from Pharmacia Upjohn in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, and that's what took us from Atlanta, Georgia to Kalamazoo, Michigan at the tender age of seven. I was seven. My sister was eight. And what I really looked forward to, Mike, was every summer, mama would always send my sister and I back to Atlanta to spend six, six and a half, seven weeks with our grandmother. It happens that my oldest aunt Eunice was born disabled. So she lived with our grand life. So when people talk to me about, they, they ask me, Tarek, where does your passion for older adults and people with disabilities mm -hmm. come from? It started there, right? I didn't know that's what was happening at that young age, but the, the, the lessons learned and the things that, you know, that I got to listen to was just 
fascinated by the conversations my grandmother would have with her friends and other family members. She ran the family from her recliner, Mike. Let me tell you, she <laughs> she would sit there and, and direct all the aunts and uncles and the cousins and nephews and uh, on what they needed to do and how they needed to do it. So, so I'd like to think that that passion really started in me at a very young age. Um, when I graduated at high school, I took a different path than most people do. Most of my peers ended up going straight to college and, you know, starting their careers four years or so after that. Um, I went into the United States Army wow. and served on active duty um, for the initial nine and a half years or first nine and a half years when I got out of the military or when I got out of uh, high school. And so, you know, I was a young kid, 19 years old was married and had a son and no marketable skills. And so, you know, I really needed to find a way to provide for my family. Um, and I had all known that, you know, I had several uncles, my grandfather served in the military. So there was that deep history um, of serving in our armed forces that I got from them. Uh, so, you know, joined the United States Army right out of high school uh, and then kind of got my college schooling done through online platforms uh, and things like that throughout that nine and a half years. And so, you know, once I transitioned out of the military, uh, the first job, I'll, I'll say the first real job I had was in retail. And I worked in the wireless industry for several years mm. Um, I owned a Verizon dealership for nine of the 15 years that I was in the wireless retail industry and had a, a lot of fun interacting with consumers, selling, you know, things. But I got to a point around 2010 where I thought, you know, God probably put me here to do things a little more impactful. <laughs> and I started looking for perhaps some opportunities um, that really got to my passion of older adults and people with disabilities. Uh, and so that really is what took me from the retail world into the not-for-profit sector back in 2012. Um, as I said, I moved into my role here at Sokoa a couple of months before uh, COVID hit us, before we uh, went through the global pandemic. Um, and, you know, prior to departing Michigan, you know, I had served in uh, capacities at senior services uh, as a business development director, chief operating officer. There was a period of time uh, where I was kind of straddling as interim CEO and COO while the board was looking, uh, you know, for the CEO's replacement. Mm -hmm. So it was a great time that I spent there, but I have loved being here in Indianapolis and leading this high functioning organization known as Sokoa. Uh, it has been a, a true pleasure and honor uh, to serve these individuals that I get to work with every day for the betterment of the consumers that we serve in our communities. Um, I'm married to my lovely wife, Laura, and Laura and I uh, were high school sweethearts, but we didn't marry right out of high school. Um, so Laura and I reconnected. It's probably been about 14 years ago now and uh, have been married now for 12. Uh, so we have a blended family. So there's six total adult children, um, three grandchildren with the most recent one uh, being born last New Year's Eve. So little Emery just turned a little uh, uh, turned one years old uh, the end of December of last year and is just doing really well. So uh, that's a little about me. Well, you um, went to the military right out of school. Where did you serve? Was it mainly in the U.S. or did they send you to other places? Did no, you get to see uh, the world? I, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually did. Um, my first duty station was Stuttgart, Germany. So uh -huh. I was stationed in Germany from 90 to 93. Um, and for those who may recall, that was the period where the first desert storm yeah. um, uh, conflict kicked off. 
And so I was in Germany when that happened. And then in 93, I came back to the States and I was stationed in Maryland uh, at, at, at Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland for three years. Um, and then in 96, I ended up going to the Middle East. I got to spend a year in Doha, Qatar. Um, <clears throat> and I think uh, that was a, an interesting role and it was an interesting environment. And it's because my name is Arabic. Yeah. Uh, they pronounce it there, Tadik. And so they thought I was initially a uh, Middle Eastern when they would hear my name. Uh, and so it was a, a really interesting uh, experience. And I got to meet a lot of great folks. Uh, and then I came back stateside for that last year and a half. And I was stationed in Lansing, Michigan, um, at the Great Lakes Recruiting Battalion. I was kind of the personnel uh, sergeant overseeing 52 recruiting stations again. Uh, I got the, to have that tough job of assigning new recruiters coming in to our command, to the one of the 52 stations, and then also, you know, uh, ensuring that those who were coming off of that recruiting duty, getting them successfully back to their next duty station in what we used to call mainstream army, right? Because recruiting was one of right. those roles where the goal of the that that arm is really to drive more uh, more enrollments, more individuals in the service, but it wasn't permanent. Uh, most recruiters would serve a two to three year run before they would go back into their primary military occupational specialty to do work there. Well, you uh, served, you said, I think, nine and a half years in the military. That clearly was different than a lot of people did or have done. And then you came back and you went off and did other other kinds of things. Do you think that your military experience and your career helped you? And how do you think that has benefited you and 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 addressed your attitudes about life going forward? Yeah, I, I would say absolutely, Mike. It has a significant impact uh, on who I am. You know, uh, the the first thing that the military put in me was structure and discipline. Uh, and then, you know, the next lessons learned that I've carried with me for forever were the 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 you know the the way to lead people leading from the front so the military taught me leadership but it taught me leadership from the lens of leading from the front which is to say i'm never going to ask somebody to do something that i'm not willing to roll my sleeves up and do myself mm -hmm. that has helped me tremendously uh, throughout my career uh, in various positions and roles that I have had. Uh, but the military absolutely had a tremendous amount to do uh, with who I am and how I go about my day-to-day, -day, um, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, et cetera. That is pretty cool. It's It's interesting. I come to the same philosophy, but from a different point uh, as I think about it and listening to you, and that is that for me, I also don't think I should expect people to do things that I haven't done, uh, and I shouldn't expect people to do a job that I'm not willing to do. For me, though, it wasn't the military that, that brought that around to my point of view, because I didn't ever get to serve in the military, but rather for me, it's I won't know about the other jobs unless I perform them. I'm not going to see other people doing it. So I don't get a lot of that information and being a curious soul. For me, it's always been, I got to do it so that I know about it because I can't talk intelligently to other people about what they're doing and so on, unless I understand it. I won't understand it unless I do it personally. And that has led me to the same philosophy that you have. And I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that people should not undertake a job or they shouldn't be telling other people about jobs that, that they haven't experienced in some way themselves because it's the only way to gain empathy. That's right. That's 100% correct. And I think it's just the, the only way to do it. It's why it makes it really fun when people 
and I have conversations about blindness and so on, one of the things that I get to say is, well, you know, you talk about it, but you've never tried it. <laughs> so, and I understand yeah, that most right. people, <laughs> and I understand that most people won't um, necessarily, but don't judge what you haven't tried or that you really don't know about. And that, of course, is a, a challenge and a subject that we all get to deal with. And now, of course, we're talking with you about aging and so on. And aging, as we grow in population, but as we grow closer because of communications and because we had such a big baby boomer era, aging is is definitely more of something that's on our mind. So you being in that that whole world, tell us a little bit more about how you think that the whole concept of aging is kind of changing how our landscape is changing not only here in the u.s but globally yeah no and that's a great question so i'll start out by throwing a few facts out there uh, that people may not realize uh our baby boom generation right it's a global phenomenon and closer to home every single day ten thousand people in the united states turn 65 years of age Next year in 2024, every member of the baby boom generation will be at least 60 years old. And by 2030, every member of the baby boom generation will be at least 65. This is what the industry is known as and what we call as the silver tsunami, silver tsunami which is yeah. basically a tidal wave. Yeah, the tidal wave of older adults. Um, in 2030, there'll be more people in America over the age of 65 than children under the age of 15. And so where does that bring us? Well, it brings us to a point of change, development, strategic thinking has to be done. And so after I had been here a year, uh, I sat down and I wrote out a 20-year vision a vision of where I saw our organization being able to be 31 December 2041 close of business. And much of much of this design work, Mike, really was about things in our control. In other words, it wouldn't be realistic, right, to develop such a lofty plan taking into consideration and focusing only on its external factors because external factors as we all know change so often but what you can do is develop that vision and plan predicated on what's in your control as an organization what you can modify and maintain inside your walls and so that 20-year vision really is to envision Sokoa serving as a model for managed long-term services and support, launching research initiatives to give us more data that will help us make more and better business decisions based on what the data is telling us. And then finally, it's about using innovation as a catalyst for success. And I always like to say the future will be about filling voids in addition to connecting people to resources. The more unmet needs we discover and the more services and products we can provide to get at those unmet needs, the more clients we know will gravitate to us and stick to us, right? I remember when I was in retail, I always used to say to my sales teams, don't just sell the phone. Sell the 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 don't don't just sell the handset. Sell the handset, some accessories and some other items that will help this consumer be sticky to this product and only this product. In the world we operate in here at Sokoa, it's the same mindset, right? We know that if we can bring more solutions to the table that we have a great chance of not only improving quality and quantity of life for the people we serve, but we also know that it makes it, it makes us, Sokoa, a stickier organization for them as a customer. 
the more items that you can address for a person, the longer they're going to stay with you, they're going to be loyal to you. And that is extremely uh, key in the work that we do. So what creates loyalty for Sokoa? You're, you're in a different environment than a profit-making company where you're selling physical items as such, but you're still looking for loyalty. What is it that's going to keep people loyal to Sokoa or to yeah, any that's agency? That's a great question. Or to any yeah, agency no. for that matter. I think in the work in the work that we do, Mike, it's really about having a great pulse of the of your satisfaction with the populations you serve. In other words, is that customer service uh, top notch? Are you doing your best at at making that environment um, easy for a customer to navigate? The work that we do and the systems that we work in, gaining access sometimes to services or connecting with the right entity is a challenge and a struggle sometimes for folks. And so if you can reduce and eliminate that struggle or challenge, that is a way to make an individual more loyal to your agency. And then in addition to that, it's connecting them, maybe there are things that we don't necessarily offer or provide, but we have a connection. We've got a partner that does do that kind of work. And so it's connecting that individual to the additional collaborative partner that you've got to help them address the need that they that they have and that needs to be addressed. So I think it really starts with developing and delivering a great customer service experience, one that has that client saying, you know, Sokoa really provided a wow customer experience for me. They've been able to provide me with so many solutions and answers and services that have kept me living in my home for as long as possible. So that's really what it looks like for me when I say, how do you make that consumer loyal to you? And then, you know, you hope that over time you start to believe or you start to develop more connections from those interactions you have with customers. In other words, we see clients who've had a great experience telling a few of their friends about that experience. And then before long, we've got those folks reaching in and leaning into us for that trusted and dependable guidance, um, solutions, answers, and provisioning of services so that they can remain independently at home as well. How many people do you serve today? So we we are interacting with roughly, I'll say on any given year, we probably have contact with about 30,000 mm. plus community members. And that and, and that could be a, a host of different things, Mike. It might be uh, an information and referral call where someone might have needed access to a resource in the community, but didn't know where to turn to get access to it. It might be these are consumers that are direct recipients of services that we have uh, provisioned uh, with a, a sub-grantee partner, or it's a service we provide directly. Um, and so that that's how we go about that piece of our, our uh, agency and business. You know, it's interesting listening to you and thinking about all of this. The, the world's changing. You know, we're getting a lot more technology. Medical science is doing so much to help people and make people more durable, help people live longer, and so on. What, how are the priorities that our senior population changing? Um, I'm sure that it's different now in terms of what people want or what they're, they're doing or capable of doing than it was 20 and 30 years ago. And that also is going to evolve. So how are the priorities changing? Yeah, I think the priorities are are changing both inside our environment and 
and outside our environment, mm -hmm. right? And I'll start with inside the environment. Things are changing inside the environment where as an organization, we have to teach each other how to, to, to do more with less. In other words, what that means is an organization like ours, uh, I mentioned earlier, we have many of our revenue streams are state and federal resources. And so while those state and federal resources, they do increase a little bit year over year, Sometimes, though, it, it's not enough to meet that consumer de demand. And so we have to teach ourselves how to do more with less, building in redundancies into our roles, cross-training our staff to be able to handle not just the things that they're used to doing day in and day out, but really getting them to embrace that mindset of, we must be able to cross train across these functions so that in the event someone needs help, we can tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, we need your help here. So internally, things are changing quite rapidly in that space. And then externally, it really is more about the changing in the systems that we operate in. One great example that I'll talk about is here in Indiana, uh, our Medicaid waiver program is not today a managed care program. It is a fee-for-service model. But Indiana has designed a Medicaid long-term services and supports managed care program that will implement middle of next year, calendar year 2024. And so that, that shift, that change from a fee-for-service model to a managed care model creates significant shifts in how our work will be done and what our role will be. And so you have to have vision on the external environment and what's happening there. And as long as your internal environment aligns to those changes and shifts that are externally happening around you, you should be able to be a, a trusted and continued resource for funders, external stakeholders, and consumers that you're serving, as well as keeping your staff thriving and happy in doing the work that they do for the community members we have a ability to serve day in and day out. Sure. Well, briefly, so what is the difference between case management model and a fee-for-service model? So how how is all that going to change? Yeah, so a, a fee-for-service model with a Medicaid waiver program, it generally means this. Um, the state is the overseer of that program. And there aren't necessarily caps in spending for services that the state is, is looking at. In a managed care environment for Medicaid, uh, in a managed care model, it is a capitated model. So that means that there will be a cap on the amount of resource that a member can utilize or can have in services each and every month. It also means that the state is shifting the risk from the state of Indiana to health insurance or health plans, managed care organizations. And so the managed care organization um, the, or, the entities that are at risk for adjusting or, or I'll say monitoring and auditing the spend for these members to ensure that members are not receiving more services than what that per member per month monthly allocation is. And so that's really the primary differences in a Medicaid fee-for-service product and a Medicaid managed care product. What it's that, about risk shifting and it's about oversight. So does that mean that services in, in one sense might decline or become less because now less funds will 
be available to spend for any given individual? So I would say, I, I don't know that I would coin it exactly <clears throat> that way, Mike. I think the way that I would explain that is, is um, with capitation in place and understanding that, you know, you can't go above that and be reimbursed by a funding source. So in a fee-for-service model, you can be reimbursed no matter what level of service right. that you provide. Right. In a managed care environment, you can go over that capitated amount, but understand there aren't additional reimbursements coming into that managed care organization to offset those extra services that are being rendered. So I say that to say there could be some scenarios where a member or a participant, um, their service plan exceeds that per member per month rate. They're going to be some of those very high cost, high acuity consumers they're going to be those very low cost consumers in a managed care environment what you're really trying to do is making sure that the majority of your census um, is within that capitated amount so that you're not absorbing more financial risk as a as an insurance company so the best way to answer your question is could there be services that might uh, be reduced. That's a possibility, but we don't know that to be 100% accurate. And mm -hmm. then we also know that there could be some scenarios where an individual service plan is much more costly than what that per member per month allocation is. What do you do in those cases? So what, well, what, we, well, what, what we, does, what does somebody do in those cases? Yeah, the in, in that scenario, Mike, the health plan or the managed care organization is at risk. They mm -hmm. have to cover that amount. Okay. They would have to cover that amount and, and not expect any additional resources from the state to reimburse those uh, agencies delivering those services in the home. Yeah, what I was really getting at uh, was, was kind of that very thing. So now the insurance industry is going to have to recommend recognize they don't have a blank check, check to just charge whatever they want, which means that they need to be a little bit more responsible, perhaps in terms of figuring out what what they're going to uh, to charge and and how that's going to work. It so it's making it a little bit more of a maybe responsible or responsive process. It absolutely does, and you know. For me, Mike, what's really been interesting and eye-opening for me uh, is I've been through a managed care implementation in Michigan. So when I first came here to Indiana, uh, managed care was not, excuse me, managed care in this program hadn't been talked about a whole lot. We started hearing about it in December of 2020. And so for me, I, I like to think I had a little more of a unique perspective into what might be happening or what that design might look like here because of that lived experience in Michigan. Yeah, um, experience always helps. <laughs> no question about yes, that. Yes, it does. Yeah, no question. <laughs> I want to go back a little bit to something I asked about earlier, talking about priorities of, of yep. the, the whole system. But for seniors... For the aging population, how are their demands and priorities changing? And and by that, I mean, I understand that people want to stay in their home as long as possible and so on. But are people, as they're getting older, wanting to, for example, stay in the workforce, um, do other kind of active things, be contributors as opposed to just being at home? And how do you help companies, for example, recognize that there really is a lot of value in people who have a lot of experience rather than just always trying to get the young person because you can pay them less, but you then lose all the tribal knowledge, if you will, and experience that a, a more senior or aging population might bring to what they do. Yeah, no, that's a great question. 
Workforce is always near and dear to my heart, particularly with our older adults. Uh, and so, you know, for me, I, I've been intentional, we at Sokoa have been intentional about developing great relationships with workforce development partners who are out there kind of working on behalf of individuals, maybe 55 and better, to get them back to work. And what I've always said is, listen, our older adults have a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience that we certainly want to continue to be a part of learning and growing with them. Sometimes we've got individuals who are, you know, been through that first career, but still have some desire and the pepper to, to really continue to work. And we find value in employing them at Sokoa. Um, we have some individuals who have retired and have taken more of a volunteer role with Sokoa as either a community member or a, a committee member, board member, uh, volunteers that are consistently helping with telephone reassurance calls to other older adults to check on them. So from my perspective, I always like to, to preach higher older, older adults, hire those individuals who have the knowledge, expertise, and that passion still burning within them. Got to hire those folks and keep them thriving and working because that institutional knowledge and what they bring to the table, Mike, you can't put a price on mm -mm. that. So I encourage other leaders in my space, in the nonprofit space and in the for-profit sector to really focus more intentionally uh, on developing some great relationships with workforce development partners who are seeking to place older uh, adults that are still out here looking for jobs. I think one of the things that, uh, you know, that I constantly think about in that space is, you know, we, we do what we call a community assessment survey of older adults every four years. And on the most recent one that concluded last year, one of the key findings was that older adults, by and large, still feel that they have a ton to contribute in the workforce, but they feel that they're underemployed uh, or unemployed. And so though that, that tells thought leaders like myself and others, we can address that. We can make that situation a little bit better by being more intentional uh, and, and, and being having the courage to offer that position to someone who may not be young or someone who might have a ton of experience um, for those roles that they have an interest in applying for and working in, in our respective agencies. And again, isn't the number of people who fit into that category going to do nothing but increase because we're helping to keep people healthier longer thriving actively longer and through organizations somewhat at least like AARP talking yes. consistently about that. Although AARP hasn't done a lot, it seems to me, with disabilities, um, whether they're disabilities with people who have had them for a long time or who are seeing their bodies change in one way or another. But nevertheless, in general, medical science is working to keep people working and are well active longer and so on, which means that the number of people who are going to fit into this category is going to grow. That's right. That's right. There will be a, I'll say there won't be a shortage of talent, Mike, <laughs> and us leaders have to do our jobs and have the courage to put those individuals to work, get them back in that workforce providing and sharing of their times and talents. How do we do that? How do we get companies, especially with lots of young people, to recognize the value that experience brings? Because so often, it seems to me, we tend to forget that. Um, we forget that it isn't just about what the innovators at a younger age know, but the experience that more 
of our aging population bring that can stabilize and help enhance the organization? How do we get people to understand that? Yeah, I, I think elevate our voices and continue to do that work. You know, there's there's this old, but I, well, I used to say education and awareness, and I still use that terminology today. I find the more organizations, the more people hear it, the more it becomes committed to memory. And if there's one thing that I've learned through all my travels, it's that the average person has to hear something at least five times before it's committed to memory. And so mm -hmm. it's not just to say it once, Mike, but to continue to reinforce that message, utilizing the various communication vehicles that you have at your disposal. It could be email. It could be a video. It could be uh, a phone call. But it's to continue to pepper our communities with knowledge so that they're very aware that there is this population out here that continues to have a lot to give uh, and that we should really be connecting with those kinds of organizations like AARP or others uh, that are helping place individuals into the workforce or back into the workforce and being intentional about that, right? It's, it's, it's really continue to reinforce the message, but ultimately, Mike, as, as leaders, we have to say, I am going to be intentional. My organization is going to be intentional about this particular thing. And, and so, you know, that, that it's, it may sound simple. It's not an easy task because it's just it's, it's that consistent reinforcement that yeah. oftentimes people forget about. Well, emotionally, we have to change our mindset. You know, we're used to the image of people get older and they just sit around because they can't do anything. And we've got to change our emotional mindset to recognize that isn't the way it is anymore, and it's been changing right along. Well, and I and and as, as I started out, you know, when we started this podcast, I said I used to watch watch my grandma run yeah. the family from her recliner. Let 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 me say she was doing that at ninety. Yeah. Okay, so this is not you know so so to your point, Mike. Of yeah, I mean, people still have that passion and desire. You're talking to someone who watched a 90-year-old woman <laughs> run the family from her recliner. So it's very true what you say, that, that, that the folks out there do still have a lot to give. But again, I always go back to organizations and leaders have to say, we are intentional about this and not just say it, but do it. Tell me about the uh, the venture studio at Sikawa in terms of how it's dealing with business problems and so on. Yeah, I, I love, thank you for that question. So our venture studio. Oh, that's just because you gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, our venture studio, uh, our venture studio really was created to build scalable revenue generating enterprises. But the way we do this is we have a vice president of innovation who's walking alongside staff members. We call those staff members entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. And what happens is that entrepreneur will approach Jonathan and talk through a concept that they have. And that concept, we want it to be aligned to Sokoa's mission right, of uh, providing those needed answers, solutions, uh, innovations to older adults in the, the communities we serve. And so Jonathan walks alongside those staff members and collaborates partners to ideate, prototype, and launch these new solutions to better meet the needs of the vulnerable populations we serve. Uh, it allows us to leverage that 50 plus years of experience in the elderly and disability service industry with today's vision to design and build the future of home and community based care. And so we're designing these products and services by and for not typically represented by venture capital initiatives. 
we have a few companies in our portfolio. The first one that I'll share and talk about is Duet. Duet is a for-profit SaaS company. It is a subscript, a service as a subscription uh, tech spinoff that has created a platform for connecting clients with home health care agencies, home care aides, and nurses. It provides the fastest way for care coordinators and care managers to identify providers that can take a new care plan. Uh, it's the easiest way for providers to grow their business because there's some data, uh, um, there's some business intelligence as part of that platform that a home care agency might decide, you know, based on the number of referrals in this zip code, we, we want to expand into that zip code. So they, they have great opportunity to grow their business. And it's the best way for individual clients to choose who they want to provide care in their homes. In 2021, Duet received an Aging Achievement Award from U.S. Aging, which is the National Trade Association that the area agencies on aging across the country belong to. The second venture that we created and launched is called Postbook. And Postbook is our newest product that launched November 16th of 2022. And what this is, is it's a postcard exchange with writing prompts. And at the end of a year's writing, you have a keepsake journal that you can put on your bookshelf for generations to look at, family members to see, um, et cetera. Postbook was created by one of our staff members. Again, one of those entrepreneurs at the start of COVID when all the schools shut down and businesses closed and people were working remotely. One of our leaders at Sokoa was trying to find something to fill the time of her kids when they were out of school. And so what she had them start doing was she had them start writing postcards to grandma and grandpa in Pennsylvania. Grandma and grandpa would then send, you know, write back and send it back to them. And the entrepreneur had an aha moment. What if we created and designed a product where we wrote the prompts? It's a beautiful sunny day outside. Write to your pen pal about what, what you're feeling today or how that makes you feel and send that postcard off. And so Postbook was born out of that interaction. So just a very cool story of how Postbook started or how it came to be. And then the coming soon is Twain Health. And Twain Health will be our second SaaS product. And what Twain Health is, is it's a closed loop referral platform that is really designed to integrate clinical care and social care entities so that you can ensure on discharge from hospital or from physician's office or you know rehab facility that when that individual goes back home, not only are there medically needed clinical services in place, but also those social determinant of health services are in place as well. So we're really excited about this product also. Are any of these programs hiring um, people in the aging population to run, coordinate, or be involved with them? Are they are they also serving as mechanisms for employing seniors? They are serving as mechanisms for employment, but not at this particular point, Mike. So I'll say that as Postbook is a very new company, um, Duet has it sits on the outside of Sokoa. So it has its own CEO and its own staff. Uh, that team is hiring individuals to work. Some of them may be older, uh, older individuals. Some may be younger. Postbook really is not, we, we don't have specific employees in that mm -hmm. uh, entity just yet. We're trying to scale it up a little bit more through some business-to-business -business sales opportunities we have before building out our cadre of staff that will be working directly in Postbook. And then Twain Health hasn't even launched yet. Uh, it is something that 
will most likely uh, be legally formed by the end of this month. Uh, and ready to launch, I'd say, early April. And so, again, the, the same kind of thing. We really want to have some, uh, some pre-sale, I'll say pre-sale success before launching so that as we begin to hire staff to begin having conversations with potential business-to-business -business suitors of this product, uh, that we can have squarely in mind, we want to offer these kinds of opportunities to all ages, not just to this population or that population, to mm -hmm. all ages. But yes, one of our uh, interests is in our older adults. Absolutely. Any opportunities down the line as you're expanding and progressing to actually explore creating services and mechanisms to truly bring more of the aging population to um, into the workforce to to actually create jobs or go out and seek lots of jobs. Yeah, I, I think I think you know what you're referring to is we're doing quite a bit uh, in that space of creating some uh, stronger communities through effective outreach and things of that nature. Uh, I think you, you know, you can't, I, I'll start out by saying, you know, we can't access what we don't know, right? Yeah, so there's yeah. a lot of information out there uh, that we're really trying to pull together. And I always love to look at the data. And as I shared with you, Mike, the data indicates that, you know, from a, from a more recent survey done of our older adult population, uh, that many older adults are are interested in still yeah. working and and you know being in the workforce and so I think making yourself available as an organization that really is out there leading the, the charge, leading from the front, letting individuals know right, having relationships with senior centers again with any kind of organization that is is moving down that road um, of employing older adults or employing individuals with disabilities, because that's another area that we have an interest in. Um, our workforce, just so you're aware, we do have a large percentage of our workforce are considered, are, are age 55 and above. So that's a great thing to be in the space that we're in and, and have uh, a workforce that's that's got a nice percentage of individuals that I would consider, you know, our older population or older workforce. Um, but 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 that that that's not enough. You have to continue to do that work and continue it. As I said, being intentional uh, about wanting to 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 be in a position to hire uh, our older adults and people with disabilities. Um, in, in our workforce. So I think the things that organizations have really got to, you know, start thinking about is, is, is your organ or is your physical location? Is it, is it accessible? Right. Cause that, that yeah. will determine how much interest you garner from those populations. So are you accessible? You know, does, does the environment meet ADA standards? Uh, all those things have to be looked at and checked into before you can really do your level best of re-employing or employing people in your organization. It's going to be very difficult to do that kind of work if a, a company is not uh, ADA compliant or they're not viewed as uh, accessible um, by the populations that you're trying to recruit and hire. Um, I think with us having great relationships and faith-based communities is a great recruiter, recruiting uh, stream or angle, if you will, to, to help hire, um, I'll say, our older populations for working. Uh, and so we, we've got great relationships with some wonderful faith-based partners um, that, that help us in that space. I think where we recruit or where we uh, put our openings has expanded quite a lot in the last three years. Uh, I remember when I first started, the, the primary place where we would post our jobs would be Indeed. Um, and now we've seen that expand to multiple vehicles, right? 
that do by and large talk to different segments of our populations um, so that we, we are, again, able to receive talent across the spectrum and not just from one source that we might have posted open roles in before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's an ever expanding world. And you know, one of the things I was just thinking is that, gee, it'd be interesting to start offering a service that seniors could fill um, the service would be as consultants to help companies determine how accessible or what they need to do to create more accessibility or inclusive and welcoming environments. Um, that'd be a oh, fascinating that is a thing to wonderful do. Wonderful idea, Mike. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you for giving that one to me. I'm writing that one down. <laughs> it's yours. It just seems like it would be interesting, you know, to bring people in and create a mechanism, and it could be a way to to bring some money to to pay people, but also into the organization to actually consult uh, and get the experts, that is the people who deal with it every day, to uh, to be able to go in and look at companies. If, and, and I would think that we're seeing a growing population of companies who also do care about access and accessibility. Yes. There are lots that don't, uh, which is part of what we have to deal with. But I would think that, that it is a growing population. And if you created an environment and that kind of a of a of a class of people and a and a a kind of a mechanism in the agency to do that that might be a really exciting thing that could be very visible and very helpful all around i agree with you and that's why i say i love that you said that i wrote that down <laughs> well we've been doing this a while but there is one more question Probably the most probing question of the day, and you're going to have yes. to answer it. You all like University of North Carolina basketball, and I haven't heard you once say that you live in North Carolina or lived in North Carolina. <laughs> so let's get to the meat of that. So, yes, uh, I, I am a tried and true love my Tar Heels. Yeah. Um, the love started when I was, I think I might have been nine or 10 years old, and I was watching a basketball game, uh, and, I, I, and, and I always say the first thing that caught my eye was the baby blue colored uniforms. Mm. That, that was the first thing <laughs> that caught my eye. But what I really gravitated to was this four corners offense that Coach Dean Smith Right. Mm -hmm. He's the longstanding uh, coach of the Tar Heels that he was running back then in the 80s, uh, early 90s. And so I started watching North Carolina then and it never stopped. Uh, <laughs> I watched them through the Michael Jordan era, the James Worthy era. But after I graduated high school and right before I left to go to the military, my mother did leave Kalamazoo, Michigan, right after uh, right after high school, and she relocated initially to Greenville, North Carolina. Oh. So there was about a two-year period, a year, year and a half period, where I did physically live in Greenville, North Carolina with my mom. And then, of course, when I would come home on leave from overseas, I would always go to North Carolina to see her. So <laughs> while I'm not from there, while I didn't attend that university, uh, I have always loved watching the North Carolina Tar Heels. Uh, they're, they're not having a great year this year, but uh, but they're still my team. <laughs> there you and and should be. I um I, my favorite my favorite North Carolina basketball story is there used to be a TV show on CBS called Without a Trace, the FBI oriented kind of show. And I flew into North Carolina one Thursday night to do a speech the next day. And I got to the hotel and I figure, okay, I'm going to unpack. What am I going to do while I unpack? And I figure I'll turn on the TV and watch Without a Trace. What the heck? Turn on the TV just before 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock comes along, and the announcer comes on and says, without a trace, will not be seen tonight at its regular time because we're going to provide the broadcast of the North Carolina State 
University of North Carolina basketball game because it was right <laughs> time getting close to March Madness, right? Yeah. And if you want to see without a trace, you can tune in Sunday morning at 2 a.m., <laughs> which was <laughs> not doing that. But but North Carolina loves its basketball. Okay, I mean, they've got three major teams, Duke, NC State, and UNC. Yeah. And yeah. it is it is so incredible and to to have done that. And I and I so I watched the game. I do have to say I don't even remember who won that game that year, but but it was it was fun and just kind of entertaining. Had these great expectations, and all of a sudden, crashing down. It's the basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> they love basketball That's like funny. Kentucky loves football. Yeah. Well. <laughs> It's okay. It's it's kind of fun. Well, this, Tarek, this has really been fun. And I really appreciate all the information. We haven't even talked about the fact of, of y'all uh, got introduced to us through Accessibi. That's right. Yes, we did. Yeah, we didn't get it. We didn't talk about that. We haven't but done yes, that. Yes, we did. So you guys are using it and it's working well? It, it is working beautifully. Um Again, it's just another opportunity to be more accessible to individuals that need us, Mike. So, you know, when when we first found out or when Dana first talked to me about this, I'm going, this is a wonderful idea. Love that we're doing this. And we've gotten some really positive feedback. And, and you know, for us, we always think about, so what's next? <laughs> right. What's that next thing? next thing that we need to be thinking about to further enhance uh, our accessibility to individuals in that digital social world. Yeah. Um, so, but, but so far I've been extremely pleased with our relationship with. Well, we uh, we're all here to provide whatever support you need. And we appreciate that. Well, I want to thank you again for being here. If people want to reach out and learn more about Sokoa and uh, maybe reach out to you and uh, and so on, how do they do that? Yep. So I think the best way for individuals to connect with us, they can visit our website, and that is www.sokoa.org. And they'll be able to access our website there, or they can contact us at our Aging and Disability Resource Center. Uh, and that number, I'll give the toll-free number, 1-800-432-2422. Uh, and then if someone has an interest and would love to connect with me directly, uh, they can send me an email. Uh, that email address is T Brown, T B R O W N, at Sakoa.org. And Sakoa is again is spelled C I C O A. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking so much time to to talk with all of us. I think this has absolutely been educational and it has also been fun. And I've yes, been it a great, has. You've been a great guest, and I love it. And hopefully, one of these days, we'll get a chance to be back there and meet you in person. Uh, I, I would love that, Mike. We'll have to do it. And yes, sir. You listening? Appreciate you listening to us today. Please give us a five star rating wherever you hear our podcast. You're also welcome to go to www.michaelhingson h i n g s o n dot com. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N dot com slash podcast and hear all of our episodes and wherever you go and listen to us, please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate it. If you know, and Tarek is you as well, anyone knows anyone who ought to be a guest or you think would be a good guest on Unstoppable Mindset, please reach out. You can also email me at Michael, H-I, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I, at Accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E, dot com. And as Tarek would tell you, if you go to Accessibe, dot com, there is a link that you can click on and where you can actually do an audit of your website or any website to see how accessible it is. That's free. So go check it out. See 
what uh, what it will tell you about how usable your website is by persons with disabilities. Again, Tarek, one more time, thanks very much for being with us. We really appreciate it, and we'll have to do more of this in the future. It's my pleasure, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much.